ಪ್ರಲಯಪಯೋಧೀಜಲೇತವಾನಸಿ ವೇದ ವಿಹಿತವಹಿತ ಚರಿತ್ರೇದ ಪ್ರಲಯಪಯೋಧೀಜಲೇತವಾನಸಿ ವೇದ ವಿಹಿತವಹಿತ್ರ ಚರಿತ್ರೇದ ಕೇಶವಧೃತ ಮೀನಾ ಶರೀರ ಜೈ ಜಗದೀಶ ಹರೇ ಜೈ ಜಗದೀಶ ಹರೇ ಜೈ ಜಗದೀಶ ಹರೇ ಕೇಶವಧೃತ ವಿಪುಲತರೆ ತಿಷ್ಟತಿ ತವ ಪೃಷ್ಠೆ ಧರಣಿ ಧರಣ ಕಿಣ ಚಕ್ರಗರಿಷ್ಠೆ ಇಹ ವಿಪುಲತರೆ ತಿಷ್ಟತಿ ತವ ಪೃಷ್ಠೆ ಕೇಶವಧೃತ ಕೂರ್ಮ ಶರೀರ ಜೈ ಜಗದೀಶ ಹರೇ ಜೈ ಜಗದೀಶ ಹರೇ ಜಯ ಜಗದೀಶ ಹರೇ ಸತಿ ದಶನ್ನ ಶಿಖರೆ ಧರಣಿ ತವ ಲಗ್ನ ಶಶಿಣಿ ಕಲಂಗ ಕಲೆ ವನ ಮಗ್ನ ದಶನ್ನ ಶಿಖರೆ ಧರಣಿ ತವ ಶವಧೃತ ಶುಕರ ರೂಪ ಜೈ ಜಗದೀಶ ಹರೇ ಜೈ ಜಗದೀಶ ಹರೇ ಜಯ ಜಗದೀಶ ಹರೇ ಕರ ಕಮಲ ಬರೇ ನ ಕಮದ ಭೂತ ಶೃಂಗ ತಲಿತ ಹಿರಣ್ಯ ಕಶಿ ಪೂತನು ಬೃಂಗ ತವ ಕರ ಕಮಲ ಬರೇ ನ ಕಮದ ಭೂತ ಶೃಂಗ ಕಶಿ ಪೂತನು ಬೃಂಗ ಕೇಶವಧೃತ ನರಹರಿ ರೂಪ ಜೈ ಜಗದೀಶ ಹರೇ ಜೈ ಜಗದೀಶ ಹರೇ ಜಯ ಜಗದೀಶ ಹರೇ ಸಿ ವಿಕ್ರಮಣೆ ಬಲ ಮದ್ಭುತ ವಾಮನ ಪದನಕ ನೀರ ಜನಿತ ಜನ ಪಾವನ ಚಲಯ ಸಿ ವಿಕ್ರಮಣೆ ಬಲ ಮದ್ಭುತ ವಾಮನ ಕೇ 
ऋषभद्रता वामन रूप जय जगदीश हरे जय जगदीश हरे जय जगदीश हरे केशवद्रता वामन रूप धीरमये जगदपगत पापम स्नपयसी पयसी शमित भवतापम क्षत्रिय रुधिरमये जगदपगत पापम स्नपयसी पयसी शमित भवतापम केशवद्रता भृगुपति रूप जय जगदीश हरे जय जगदीश हरे जय जगदीश हरे केशवद्रता भृगुपति रूप जय जगदीश हरे रसी दिक्षुरणे दिक्पति कमनीय दश मुख मौली बलिम रमणीय पितरसी दिक्षुरणे दिक्पति कमनीय दश मुख मौली बलिम रमणीय केशवद्रता राम शरीर जय जगदीश हरे जय जगदीश हरे जय जगदीश हरे केशवद्रता राम शरीर शिव पुषि विषदेव सनम जलदाभम हलहति भीति मलित यमुनाभम विषदेव सनम जलदाभम हलहति भीति मलित यमुनाभम केशवद्रता हलधर रूप जय जगदीश हरे जय जगदीश हरे जय जगदीश हरे यज्ञ विधेर श्रुति जात सदय हृदय दर्शित पशुघात निंदसी यज्ञ विधेर अह श्रुति जात केशवद्रता बुध शरीर जय जगदीश हरे जय जगदीश हरे जय जगदीश हरे ता बुध शरीर जगदीश हरे जने वहन धने कलयसी कर बालम धूम के तुम इव किम पिकराल निवहन धने कलयसी कर बालम किम पिकराल केशवद्रता कल की शरीर जय जगदीश हरे 
जय जगदीश हरे जय जगदीश हरे देव कवेरी दमुद तमुदारम शृणु सुखदम शुभदम भवसारम श्री जय देव कवे दमुद तमुदारम केशवद्रता दश विध रूप जय जगदीश हरे जय जगदीश हरे जय जगदीश हरे केशवद्रता दश विध रूप जय जगदीश हरे केशवद्रता दश विध रूप जय जगदीश हरे जय जगदीश हरे जय जगदीश हरे केशवद्रता दश विध रूप जय जगदीश हरे जय जगदीश हरे O Keshava, O Lord of the universe, O Lord Hari, who have assumed the form of a wonderful dwarf Brahmana, all glories to you. With your massive steps, you deceive King Bali, and with the Ganges water emanating from the nails of your lotus feet, you deliver all the living beings in this world. So, today's the appearance day of Lord Vamanadev and Jiva Goswami. We'll be reading about both great personalities. Uh, first, we'll do the Bhagavatam verse. I'll read just one pastime, <clears throat> Jiva Goswami, and then we'll jump right into some of the pastimes and teachings in this past uh, Lord Vamanadev's appearance. So, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya <clears throat> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Okay, so Mukunda's chosen 8th Canto, 18th chapter, text 12. Yat tad vapur bhati vibhushana yudhar avyakta chid vyaktam adharyad darihi babuva tenaiva sa vamano vatuhu Sampasyator divya gatir yata nataha yata vapu is it uh, Brahma Samhita right this melody you think so is it long enough for that or no eighteen twelve yes the other one okay. Yatad vapur bhati vibhushana yudhar Avyakta chid vyakta madhara yadarihi 
बभूवते नवामनोवत संपाश्यतोर्दिव्या गतिर्यता यथापूर्भाति विभूषणायुधा अव्यक्त व्यक्त बभूवते नवामनोवत संपश्यतोर्दिव्या गतिर्यता न यदूर्भाति विभूषणायुधा अव्यक्त व्यक्त धारयदरी बभूवते नवामनोवत संपश्यतोर्दिव्या गतिर्यथा न Anyone like to chant? भाति विभूषणायुधारभूवते नवामनोवत संपश्यतोर्दिव्य गतिर्यताभाति विभूषणायुधार Can we open the door a little bit? Okay. It's so a translation. The Lord appeared in his original form with ornaments and weapons in his hands. Although this ever-existing form is not visible in the material world, he nonetheless appeared in this form. Then, in the presence of his father and mother, he assumed the form of Vamana, a Brahmana dwarf, a brahmachari, just like a theatrical actor. Om mangyan timirandasya gyananjana salakaya chakshul unminitais mai sri gurave namaha shri chaitanya mano bistam stapitam dhyana bhutale swayam rupa kadamayam dadati svabadantikam sri krishna chaitanya prabhu nitanam dasya dvaiti gadadhara shiva shri gaur bhakti brinda hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 ram hare ram 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 hare hare banche kapatru bascha kripa sindhu bevacha padidanam bhavani bho vaish So, 
I wanted to read first a little bit about Jiva Goswami, get the blessings of the devotees, and then read a little bit about Vamana Dev. The Jiva Goswami is the youngest of the six Goswamis. Srila Prabhupada said he was the greatest scholar that ever lived. And many scholars, Iandologists, will also recognize his level of scholarship is unprecedented. Those who study India and the history of India and the different sects and so on. And of course, in our line of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, he is recognized in that position. Um, there's a lot to be said. We could spend a whole day reading about Jiva Goswami and all the books he compiled and so on. But I just wanted to read about one pastime, just one pastime. Now, uh, he went to Vrindavan and took shelter of uh, Sanatan Goswami and Rupa Goswami. And it says here, out of humility, now Sanatan Goswami was the elder brother Rupa Goswami. He was the... Um, unofficial mayor of Vrindavan, most respected of all the saintly persons. Even, even common people would go to him with their problems and everyone loved and respected him for his uh, spirituality, but also even practical advice because he was a minister in the government for some time. He would ask how their family was doing, how their cows and crops were doing, and sometimes they'd ask him advice and he'd give advice and so on. And everyone loved him very, very dearly. And he was Rupa Goswami's older brother. So when Jiva Goswami arrived in Vrindavan, he was thinking of taking uh, initiation from Sanatana Goswami. Uh, but it says here, but out of humility, Sanatan deferred the responsibility of initiating Jiva Goswami to Rupa Goswami. Before Rupa Goswami initiated Sri Jiva, however, he decided to test his metal. That's M-E-T-T-L-E, -T -T -E, in case you're wondering. Not M E T A L. So, what does that mean to test someone's metal? Do you know? It's, hmm? it's, it's character. Yes. That's what the, the spiritual master does. Someone says, I want to take initiation from you. Well, let's just see how serious you are about taking initiation and your understanding of it. To this end, Rupa gave Jiva menial service to perform. He had Jiva prepare articles for deity worship, beg alms, prepare food. Research, research texts, massage his feet, and prepare palm leaves for his writing. Highly pleased with Jiva Goswami's sense of selfless service, Sri Rupa formally initiated him into the Chaitanyaite Vaishnavism. Some months passed. Here's the story. A traveling scholar named Rupa Narayan Saraswati came to Vrindavan. He was well known as one of the most learned men in the country, and it is said that he could not be defeated in philosophical debate. In fact, he was called Digvijay, which means that person who has conquered everyone in all directions. Do you think he had a chip on his shoulder? Okay, I think he had a log. Okay. Uh, his pride, oh, here it is. His pride, however, was as vast as his learning. <laughs> so his pride was as vast as his learning. And it, as he went from village to village in order to wrangle with local scholars, he demanded a jayapatra, or a certificate of victory from his opponents. You beat me, I surrender, sign so-and-so. There you go, the date and everything after the, he lo they lost during the debate. By this time, Rupa and Sanatan were well known all over northern India as the greatest of all scholars. In Rupa Narayan's usual arrogance, he rudely challenged the two famous brothers to a debate. When Rupa and Sanatan declined, the proud Raman, uh, Rupa Narayan said, you are obviously frauds. If you were as learned as people say you are, you would both accept my challenge. With great humility, Rupa and Sanatan said that their reputation was exaggerated by well-wishers and that they were, in fact, not fit to debate such a learned and undefeatable individual. Rupa Narayan was greatly pleased to hear this. Immediately thinking of his reputation, he asked for his usual Jaya Patra so he could show others that he had defeated Rupa and Sanatan. Without hesitation, the two brothers signed such a significant certificate and went on their way. All right, Krishna, let's go. Get out of here. Get away from this guy. <clears throat> Blinded by vanity, Rupa Narayan felt that he was now, 
the greatest scholar of all time. He completely neglected the fact that he had defeated Rupa and Sanatan only by default and that it was their sheer humility that allowed him to him easy victory. Moreover, Rupa Narayan soon heard that Rupa and Sanatan had a young nephew who was quickly developing a reputation, reputation that was equal to theirs. Who's that? Okay, okay, just ask him. Okay. Rupa Narayan knew that if he really wanted to establish himself as the greatest of all scholars, then he would have to defeat the young Jiva Goswami, Jiva as well. Approaching Jiva Goswami, Rupa Narayan presented his letter stating that he had defeated Rupa and Sanatan. Jiva was incensed. How could his teachers, Rupa and Sanatan, who were intimate associates of the Lord, be, defi be defeated by an ordinary scholar or even by the greatest of scholars? Rupa Narayan demanded that Jiva enter debate with him for once, he defeated Jiva, he said, his reputation would be unequaled. As Jiva listened to the detasteful boasting of Rupa Narayan, he felt an intense urge to silence him once and for all. Jiva's youth got the better of him, although his uncles avoided wasting valuable time in some mundane debate, Jiva accepted the challenge. Young Jiva spent seven days on the banks of the Jamuna trying to vindicate the reputation of his uncles. On the final day, the contest of scholarship was complete. Jiva had won the debate. After this, Rupa Narayan went away in great shame and was never again seen in Vrindavan. He did appear again in the pastimes of Naratam Das Thakur, though. Do you know that? I'll leave that for another day. Jiva, on the other hand, was anxious to share his conquests of Rupa and Sanatan. He was especially excited to tell the good news to Rupa, his spiritual master. When he approached Rupa Goswami, however, he was severely chastised. <clears throat> you have prematurely taken the renounced order of life, Rupa told him, and consequently you were not able to conquer your anger and sense of pride. No one who rejoices in humiliating others who has, asserts his own worth, is fit to live in Vrindavan. You are thereby banished and you should leave immediately. That was not what he was expecting. Severely humbled, Jiva bowed to his master and quickly left Vrindavan for neighboring Mathura. He took Rupa Goswami's harsh words to heart and practiced great austerities in an attempt to atone for his misconduct. It is said that he lived in the hollow of a tree, ate simple food, and only once a day, and took a vow of silence, and that was to last for one solid year. Can anyone do that? Can't even find a tree around here with a hollow in it big enough to live in. So he was very, very, you know, uh, moved by that instruction by Rupa Goswami. The exile might have lost, lasted even longer, but here's the story. Here's how it ends. But it was cut short by the mercy of Sanatan Goswami. When Sanatan discovered what had happened to Jiva, he immediately went to Rupa and told him that he was neglecting to follow one of Sri Chaitanya's cardinal teachings. Rupa said, what? What teaching am I not following? Please tell me. To this, Sanatan said, you recite the teachings of our master. When you get to the, to the one in question, I will let you know. As Rupa patiently recited all of Sri Chaitanya's precepts, he finally came to Jiva Doi, which means kindness to all living beings. Doi meaning kindness and Jiva meaning living beings. Jiva, however, is also the name of Jiva Goswami. Realizing the import of Sanatan's curious pun, Rupa laughed heartily and decided to be kind to Jiva. In this way, Rupa rescinded his banishment. Okay. Uh, and then Prabhupada says something, because sometimes there's, it says in here, some foolish people criticize Jiva Goswami for doing what he did. But Prabhupada says here in this connection, uh, critics of Jiva Goswami do not know that humility and meekness are appropriate when one's own honor is insulted, but when Lord Vishnu or the Acharyas are blasphemed, one should not be humble and meek, but must act. 
One should follow the example given by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Lord Chaitanya says in his prayer, one can chant the holy name of the Lord in a humble state of mind, thinking oneself lower than the straw on the street. One should be more tall than a tree, devoid of all sense of false prestige, and should be ready to offer all respects to others. In such a state of mind, one can chant the holy name of the Lord constantly. Nevertheless, when the Lord was informed that Nityananda Prabhu was injured by Jagai Madai, he immediately went to the spot, angry like fire, wanting to kill him. Thus, the Lord, thus Lord Chaitanya has explained in his verse, uh, by the example of his own behavior, one should tolerate insults against oneself, but when there is blasphemy committed against superiors, such as other Vaishnavas, one should be neither humble nor meek. One must take proper steps to counteract such blasphemy. So it's a wonderful story of Jiva Goswami and uh, what real humility is and uh, using his scholarship to uh, clear the name of his spiritual masters. Srila Jiva Goswami Ki Jai. So again, there's uh, volumes to read about him. Okay, so about pastimes of Lord Vamana Dev. So... Does everyone know the pastime, pretty much? His appearance. Bali Maharaj had taken the heavenly planets and Lord Vishnu came in this particular form to help the demigods regain the heavenly planets. Now, Bali Maharaj was the grandson of who? Prahlad Maharaj. So... Uh, 19 chapter. We're going to pick up in the middle of the pastimes here. I'll do the best I can to get through this. 8, 19. If anyone wants to follow around, follow along, it's uh, 19th chapter, verse 42. That's where I'm starting, just jumping around. So what happens is Bali Ma, uh, Vamanadev shows up. One, one of the uh, opulences of the Lord is beauty. And there are different incarnations of the Lord that exemplify beauty. And Vamanadeva is one of them. Although appearing in a dwarf or some say midget form, very, very small, short, uh, he was so beautiful and effulgent. So when he appeared, he appeared in the assembly or the sacrificial arena of Bali Maharaj, uh, everyone was stunned. It said it looked like the sun was rising, coming right up and came right into the assembly. And he's a Brahmin boy, and of course, Bali Maharaj being a king, he's so attracted to him, he just said, is there something I can give you? you know, some, would you like to beg some charity? Because that's what Brahmins would do. Uh, there'd be a certain time of the day, the king would have open court, and Brahmins could come and ask for help, some charity or whatever, and the king would give accordingly. So it's not, that's the etiquette. So he appears, and he's so beautiful and charming, he says, uh, what would you like? And that's when he said, I just want three steps of land. That's all. He said, you're crazy. I can give you, I'm, I'm, I took over the, the universe of Indra. I could give you planets and this and that. And you only want three steps of land. You know, where'd you go to school? He didn't say that exactly, but he kind of said that. He said, what a foolish thing to ask for, right? If I can give you $10 million and you only ask me for 25 cents, what's going on there? And he asked him why only three steps of land. You know what his answer was? He said, well, if you can't be satisfied with just the basic necessities of life, you'll never be satisfied with anything. And that's true. The no, no, nothing's enough, you know. What's enough? I want more and more and more and more and more and more. But if you're satisfied, then you're always satisfied. So that was his trick, actually. And then Bali Maharaj said, okay. And then his spiritual master stepped in, Sukhacharya, who realized this was Vishnu, and said, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. This is Lord Vishnu. If you, if you, you know, give it to him, he's going to take everything from you, which means I won't have any job. Right? That, that was his thinking. I won't have a job because, you know, I'm your family priest, the royal priest, and I get a really good salary here, and it's pretty cushy. But if everything's gone, I'm back out on the street. i got to collect unemployment and find another job somewhere. Right? So he's thinking about himself. So in here... Uh, he actually tells him uh, that, uh, we're starting with text uh, 42 so he's telling him you know he said you can turn this around you can say I don't want to give you anything so he says here you know therefore it's safe to say no 
Although it is a falsehood, it, is, it protects one completely. It draws the compassion of others toward oneself. In other words, someone asks you for some help, and you go, no. You know? Even though you can help, you say no. It gives one full facility to collect money from others for oneself. Nonetheless, if one always pleads that he has nothing, he is condemned, he, for he is a dead body while living or while still breathing, he should be killed. In other words, you shouldn't say no all the time, but if there's a circumstance where you just don't want to give, you can say, no, I can't help you. Hey, do you have some change you can spare? And your pockets are full of money, you go, no, I don't have anything in my pocket. Well, you can do that once or twice, maybe, but you shouldn't do it all the time. You should try to help people. So he's saying you can turn this around, and then he gives this famous verse here where he gives all the times where you can actually lie. It's okay to lie to people. He says, in flattering a woman to bring her under control, in joking, in a marriage ceremony, do you take her to be your lawfully wedded wife? Sure. I don't know, in <laughs> a marriage ceremony, <laughs> says that. In earning one's livelihood, for you no profit, as Prabhupada would say, you go to the, oh, for you no profit. Uh, when one life's in danger, in protecting cows in Brahminical culture, or in protecting a person from an enemy's hand, falsity is never condemned. So he was saying, you can lie about this because, you know, he's going to take everything, and then you're a king, and you have no, no money, no facility, so it's okay to lie about this. That's the spiritual master's advice. Okay? And then we jump to uh, chapter 20, text 1. Uh, it says, when uh, Sukadeva Go, Suk uh, Goswami says, O King Prikit, when Bali Maharaj was thus advised by his spiritual master, Sukacharya, and the thing is, Sukacharya said, This is Vishnu, not a Brahmin. This is Vishnu. He's going to take everything. So he's telling him, You go lie to Vishnu. You can lie to Vishnu like that. When Bali Maharaj was thus advised by his spiritual master, Sukhachari, his family priest, he remained silent for some time. Just thinking about this. Hmm. And then after full deliberation, he replied to his spiritual master as follows. Uh, Bali Maharaj said, as you have already stated, the principle of religion that does not hinder one's economic development, sense gratification, fame, or means of livelihood is the real occupational duty of the householder. I also think that this religious principle is correct. I am the grandson of Maharaj Palad. How can I withdraw my promise because of greed for money when I have already said that I would give this land? How can I behave like an ordinary cheater, especially toward a brahmana? There is nothing more sinful than untruthfulness. Because of this, Mother Earth once said, I can bear any heavy thing except a person who is a liar. Okay, what's the heavy thing that Mother Earth is bearing? Hmm? No, just an object, something really heavy. Mountains. mountains. What's a big mountain? Mount Everest. Mount Everest. Well, Meru is Mount Everest. Or just, uh, just, just, you know, the Sierra Nevadas, or oceans. Can we, could you try to, you know, lift up the ocean over there? So these are all very, very heavy, and the Earth is just, that's fine. But the one thing she can't handle is the weight of one liar. That's what she's saying. Hare Krishna. He says here, Bali Mara says, I don't fear hell, poverty, an ocean of distress, fall down from my position, or even death itself, as much as I fear cheating a Brahmin. Uh, and then he talks about the Dichi and Shibi, many other people attain fame for giving and charity, you know, even at a great, uh, great difficulty for them. Uh, so many people lay down their lives giving in charity. Uh, just want to skip ahead here. He's saying, O oh, great sage, O oh, great saintly persons like you, being completely aware of Vedic principles of, for performing ritualistic ceremonies and yagyas, worship of Lord Vishnu in all circumstances. Therefore, whether that same Lord Vishnu has come here to give me all benedictions or to punish me as an enemy, I must care, carry out his order and give him the requested tract of land without hesitation. So he decides to do it. And what does uh, Sukacharya think about this? 
Thereafter, the spiritual master, Sukhachari, being inspired by the Supreme Lord. So Krishna's in his heart, and he told him to do this. And listen what he did. Cursed his exalted disciple, Bali Maharaj, who was so magnanimous and fixed in truthfulness that instead of respecting his spiritual master's instructions, he wanted to disobey his order. He said, although you have no knowledge, you have become so-called learned person, and therefore you dare to be so impudent as to disobey my order. Because of disobeying me, you shall very soon be bereft of all opulence. So who inspired him to say that? Vamanadev, because he was going to take away all his opulence. And then he left. Okay. So, uh, but he, although he was cursed by his spiritual master, it says he never deviated from his determination. He offered the gift of land and his promise. So uh, uh, it says here, Bali Maharaj, okay, so he said, okay. And then the, his wife came and decorated him with a, a necklace, pearls of necklace, uh, was a necklace of pearls. Um, they washed his feet uh, very jubilantly, took the water on their head. And, and then all the residents of the heavenly planet started showering flowers on Bali Maharaj and his wife and the whole scene. Because he had decided to do this. And then it says, uh, guess what happens? The Lord assumes an amazing form. He starts expanding, expanding, expanding. His first step, he covers the whole earth. And then the second step, he pokes a hole in the universe. And that's where Lord Brahma appears and worships the Lord. And that water is the Ganga, which is flowing through this universe, the different forms of the Ganges. And uh, it says here that uh, in text 21, uh, chapter 21, so it's just that, uh, all, you know, just, it's a whole description of what was seen in all the different parts of the universe. Then you go to chapter 21, and uh, seeing that Lord Vamanadev has taken everything, guess who gets upset? all of his uh, soldiers and, and, and associates in the palace, they get all upset. Now Vamana Dave's taken everything from us. He's stolen everything. So they decide that, uh, what is this, text 21? Oh, no, uh, text 9 in that chapter. This Vamana Dave is certainly not a Brahman of the best of cheaters, Lord Vishnu. Assuming the form of Brahman, he has covered his own form and thus working for the interests of the demigods. Uh, and they, what it is, they actually attacked. They got all upset. And they started attacking Lord Vamanadev. And, uh, and it says what happened. It says, therefore, it's our duty to kill Vamanadev. And they attacked him. And it says, and they pushed forward to kill Vamanadev. O king, when the associates of Lord Vishnu saw the soldiers of the demons coming forward in violence, they smiled. Why did they smile? <laughs> they were warriors and shut down. Well, that's a good fight. And they actually knew they had no chance. So, okay, come on. Taking up their weapons, they forbade the demons to continue their attempt. Nanda, Sunanda, Jai, Vijay, Prabhala, Bala, Kumuda, these are all personal associates of the Lord. Uh, they were as powerful as 10,000 elephants and now being began killing the soldiers of the demons. When Bali Maharaj saw this, happening to his own soldiers, uh, he remembered the curse of Sukhachari and forbade his soldiers to continue fighting. And he told them, now is not the right time. If you continue fighting, we'll lose, you'll all be killed because it's just not the right time. Sometimes the time is right, sometimes it's not. Just like we took over the heavenly planets some time ago, it was the right time for us, but time is not favoring us, so don't be foolish. Like that. Uh... And then text 25. So what happens? There's a big fight going on. Shukadev Goswami continued, O king, in accordance with the order of their master, Bali Maharaj, all the chiefs of the demons and the daishas entered the lower region of the universe and they were driven away by the soldiers of Vishnu. Uh, thereafter, uh, it says here, Garuda appeared and he tied up Bali Maharaj. Tied him up. And... Lord Vamanadev said, uh, you know, you, you promised me three steps of land. You promised me three steps of land. You've only delivered two, right? Just like if, 
And Mogalila asked you for some new dhotis. And you said, I'll give you three. And you bring him two. So he's going to say, where's the third dhoti? Right? You said you'd give me two. I went, where's the third dhoti? So he said, where's the third, what's, what are you going to do with the third step? Now, he's covered everything. Everything's gone. The planet Earth, the whole unit. What, what does Bali Maharaj have left? His head. He said, place it on my head. And uh, one of the commentaries say that what this means is that Krishna, all of your possessions, Bali Maharaj was in charge of the whole universe. He took it away from Indra. So you could say the whole universe belonged to him. All his possessions, Vamanadev took them. But that wasn't good enough. In other words, just giving our possessions, our things to Krishna is not good enough. What does Krishna want? Us, our surrender, our heart. And uh, Bali Maharaj is known to have attained perfection. Uh, Atma Devedanam, right? That's his perfection, Bali Maharaj. Atma Devedanam, giving everything. Atma means the heart. So this is when, when Bali Maharaj said, put it on my head. I surrender to you as your devotee. And he just, uh, everything was surrendered. So Krishna, this pastime is showing how Krishna wants everything. Right? Just like us at George Harrison, he was talking to Prabhupada, and he was saying how oh, Prabhupada, you know, people come and they, they, they want my money. And Prabhupada said, I want all, all your money and I want you too. <laughs> Prabhupada wasn't bashful. Yes, I want all your money and I want you. I want you. That's the most important thing. So Krishna wants everything. He wants all of our, because all of our possessions, who do they belong to? Bhamana, they've showed that. We don't own anything, because in a moment, Krishna can take it away. For, for the atheist, Krishna takes everything, actually for everyone, Krishna takes everything away in the form of time, Kala Rup. In the course of time, everything we have will be taken away. You like that hat? You don't like the hat? Why don't you give it to him? Okay. See, it's been taken away. So the point is, every single thing we have in due course of time will be taken away. There's nothing that won't be taken away from us. Now, that means our external things, like these fancy clothes we wear, right? Neck beads, this, that. Our seeker will fall off one day. You'll become like me. You get a bald spot where your seeker's supposed to be. You can't even grow a seeker anymore. So all kinds of things. And then our body is taken away by time. Right? Yes. What is, is In the Bhagavatam, there's a story of, uh, what's his name? The allegorical story. Paranjana, and this old lady comes and embraces him, and she's Jara, old age, gives him a big hug. Old age comes and just hugs you, and you just get really old. And no one, no one likes an old person pretty much, right? It's like, phew, old people, you get really old, right? And that's where we're going to become. And then sooner or later, that goes too, and we have to leave it all behind. There's nothing we can hold on to. So Krishna takes everything as time. He's going to take it anyway, so he might as well just surrender to him, give it to him, use it in his service. That's the positive. Instead of holding on, holding on, holding on, holding on, until he just rips it out of our hands. So we don't want that to happen. And, it's, and the possessions are not as important as our heart. Who's got our heart? That's a question. Ask yourself. Who's got my heart? Who? No, he doesn't. So who's got our heart? You know, we, we, no, he doesn't. We, we, we absorb, in other words, we're absor our affection is deposited in so many different things in this world. The most important thing, I just, you, you, this comes up in the story of Nalukuvara uh, uh, Manigriva, in the purport in the Krishna book in the Bhagavatam, but the dearest thing to us is actually our body, right? And sometimes it's brought up when there's an emergency, we immediately take care of ourselves. We think of running out the door first. You know, very few people will save other people. It's like, I'm out of here, right? There's a problem. I, I, whenever I meet a police officer, a fireman, I always ask them, you've got an interesting job. You run in when most people are running out. It's an interesting job. Everyone's running out, but they run in. It's quite an interesting mentality to help people and so on. But... Uh, it's the dearest thing to us, our body. Ma I am this body. Everything in connection with the body is mine. That's where our heart is. 
all of this, what's going on in this material world. And Krishna wants it. It really belongs to him. So that's the one thing Bhamana Dev is bringing out in this, that that third step means, you know, so, and that's why Bali Maharaj understood that. And he surrendered everything. And Bhamana Dev became his, or is his, doorkeeper. He brought him to a, 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 a subterranean and heavenly planet, which is more beautiful than even Indra's abode. So he took over Indra's abode, but now he's been given an abode even more beautiful and opulent than Indra's abode. And on top of that, Vamanadeva is his doorkeeper, keeping an eye on things, his security, his security like that. And there are different people who came. I think, didn't Ravana once come there? And Vamanadeva said, out, like that. He came to challenge Bali Maharaj. So this is a, a few features of the story of, of Amana Dave. It's getting late, so I'm going to stop. Are there any questions or comments on this particular aspect of the story? Yes. One thing I hadn't realized is that the reason that, um, or at least the external reason why why Vamana Dave sent. Bali Maharaj to um, I forgot I think it's Rasatala or something like that but um, Rasatala yeah is because he couldn't fulfill his promise because he he said you yes. promised you yeah. promised to give me charity you three steps of land yeah. but you didn't give you weren't able to give me three steps of land so therefore the rule is you have to go to hell yes and so he's punishing him but at the same time he's um, he assures him at the end of this whole thing that I forgot exactly what the Otsutala uh, that's what it is Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but still he assured him, he said, Oh great hero, I shall always be with you and give you protection in all respects along with your associates and paraphernalia. Moreover, you will be able to see me there. And then he says, and then yeah, because there you will see my supreme prowess, your materialistic ideas and anxieties that have arisen from your associations from your association with the demons and Donovas will immediately be vanquished. So it's like a punishment, but also at the same time he's Great blessing. Blessing, blessing and purifying. Okay, here's a pop quiz. What relative of Bali Maharaj has landed up in Krishna Leela as a witch? Ah, uh, you go ahead, you explain the story. Uh, Bali Maharaj's sister, what's, what, what is the name? There's a name, I forget. And okay. she was very attracted to the beauty, but at the same time she was angry. When all this came down. All, all this came happen. So, and when Krishna she actually thought of? How to kill. <laughs> how to kill. <laughs> yeah. Amana Dev. Yeah, and so in Krishna Lila, she became Putana. Putana. And then I guess even then, she got the benediction of yeah. being a mother. Right. So, she got purified and got the benediction of being a mother. I just, I was wondering how does um, the Lord kind of have these incarnations like manifested and it's like based on time and circumstance and or when he's like in his like sleeping state he just like kind of like dreams it and kind of like manifests it from his pores or something how does that happen actually how? where did they come from yeah well there's one verse that says all the incarnations come through Mahavishnu but there's scheduled there's that chapter that says scheduled incarnations of the Lord so Vamana Dev appeared in this universe quite some time ago, but it, he's appearing in some universe right now. At every moment, his pastimes are going on. They're Nichalila, they never stop. So there's all these pastimes, and Lord's pastimes means with the devotees. The main reason the Lord is appearing in this world is for his devotees. He kills demons on the side and straightens things out, but he has his devotees. And he's appearing with those devotees in different pastimes to deliver the fallen souls. So Krishna's moving throughout the whole cosmic manifestation, all the different universes and all many different incarnations. Some are major, some are minor, simply for the deliverance of the fallen souls. So you don't have to worry. You know, you know Krishna's got it all together and he's coming on schedule to deliver the fallen souls. And those schedules given in the scriptures, that's why one can't make it up. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he's instructing Rupa and Sanatana Goswami specifically about the incarnations of the Lord, 
that they're, they're described in the scriptures. Someone can't say, I remember many years ago, we got a, someone handed me this flyer from India, and it was this man in South India who said he was the Kalki avatar. He was a businessman in South India. The only thing he had going for him, he had dark complexion, but he didn't look like Krishna at all. And he wasn't riding a white horse or anything like that, but he was claiming he was the Kalki avatar. So it's not the end of Kali Yuga. Why should we believe he's Kalki? And he didn't have any of the symptoms, and he wasn't killing any demons or anything like that, but he was telling everyone he was the Kalki avatar. So, you know, the, the symptoms are there, and when the Lord comes, it's described, you know. And that's what we just sang. He's saying the Das, das Avatar Stotram. They're coming at different times, you know, at different time, periods in the universe. You know, is that okay? Correct. Do you, we know where Krishna was at in another point of the universe while Balaam and Dave incarnation was happening simultaneously? What universe he was in? Yeah. But just. Uh, uh, I don't know yeah. myself. I'm sorry. I wasn't given the, the memo. Okay. But he was there. He's appearing in every universe. All of his pastimes. Not that he appears in one universe and goes through all the different... Krishna's living Govardhan Hill right now. He's dancing with the gopis. He's killing Vilmasura. He's on the battle of Kukshetra. Every single pastime is happening. Just like the sun is moving like this. Every second is that time somewhere in this world. So, you know, Krishna's great. So, I mean, just if he only appeared in one universe, that's enough. But he doesn't do that. Every single pastime is going on right now, right now, right now, right now in some universe. That's Krishna. Just make sure you know what universe is appearing in next when you leave your body so you can join them, okay? Make sure you get the memo. Okay. Check your email more often. In the spam folder, too. Just in relation to uh, going back to Jiva Goswami, um, it's interesting because this pastime that happened in Rupa Goswami, you know, banishing him from Vrindavan, but then Prabhupada giving this understanding that, oh, actually he did the right thing. So maybe you could just comment on that a little more because you could say, well, if he did the right thing, why was there such a you know, severe chastisement and you know, banish, banishment if he's doing the right thing? Well, whenever we see situations like this amongst very great souls, we can understand it's the Lord's hand. Because why wouldn't Rupa Goswami say, you know, understand that he was just doing it to defend his spiritual master and his spiritual uncle, you know, and then, you know, maybe say something like, ordinarily you wouldn't do this, but I can understand it was out of humility that you wanted to protect our reputation and so on. But sometimes things are done like this, very extreme, to, to really make a, open our eyes to some very important lessons about humility. And uh, that was the main thing in the story about humility, but also that one should not tolerate when the Lord and the devotees are offended. One can become like fire. So these things come out, and it came out in a, in a pastime, obviously orchestrated by the Lord because of Rupa's uh, exalted position, some other Krishna in the heart, just like Krishna in the heart told Bali Maharaj to curse his disciple that he's going to lose everything and go to hell. And guess what happened? He lost everything and went to hell. So that's my understanding. I guess there's also like this pastime of Chota Haridas and the Chaitanya Tritamrita. I mean, if you read about what he exactly did, it's kind of like, okay, well, it could seem like a very severe because in many ways he didn't do anything wrong. And some of the right, commentaries and purports explain, okay, this was all orchestrated to teach. He, he was used as, a, as, a, as, an a, as an example. And because he was such a great devotee, he was able to be used as an example to teach others. So anyways, yeah, that, but like you're that's saying. That's a very good point, what you just made. That's it right there. So we can end here in the time? Yeah, you think so? Is that a... Is that a my God, that, that's the yes, no. <laughs> okay, then we'll end. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Glory to Prabhupada. <laughs> Do they have a uh, head bobbling class here? In the, in the Bhakta program, there's one chapter on head bobbling.
Make sure you get it right.